All right. Here we are. We're going down the state of Florida. We're headed to a shoot. I've got my man Connor here with me. And we haven't done a question and answer podcast in quite a while. It's been actually a couple of years. So thought this would be a good opportunity. And I am not filming this. Connor's filming it. I got my headphones on, perfectly safe driving down the road. So I hope I'm not scaring anyone, but I promise you I'm perfectly safe. It's just like talking on the telephone. Um, so Connor's got the questions. We had some people submit questions through email, through the text. You can always text me your questions at 305 930 7346. You can email podcast at saltwaterexperience.com and, uh, and, and ask some questions. We've been collecting some questions and we've been getting more questions recently. Um, all about kind of seasonality and the keys and I don't know, all kinds of other things. So I'm not sure what Connor's got queued up there, but let's go, let's go, Connor. What do you got first? So the first question is, uh, I'm looking into making a living in the outdoors. What are the first steps you would suggest? Hmm. Making a living in the outdoors. So kind of, I assume, and probably shouldn't make any assumptions here, but I'm assuming that that would probably be something associated with water. And my first um, suggestion would be stay in school <laughs> um, and and get your degree if if that's if that's a if that's a, a possibility I would definitely consider doing that because uh, making a living in the outdoors is is certainly um, difficult more difficult than a lot of people imagine and you know if you can get your degree and you have that might as well um, Secondly, I wouldn't discourage anybody from doing it. It's been really great for me, and um, I, I would I would certainly encourage people to follow their passion. That's kind of what this whole podcast is about. So if that's you, my first uh, piece of advice would be to get your captain's license. Actually, first piece of advice is stay in school, get your degree. Second piece of advice is to get your captain's license. So that can happen hand in hand with getting your degree. You can get your captain's license um, online. You can get your captain's license in a, in a way that you can uh, still go to school and you don't have to quit your whatever you're doing. You don't have to quit your job to get your captain's license. It's something that you can study for at night, something that you can um, get while you're either working or doing uh, going to school. So getting the captain's license is really big if you plan on working in the water because maybe you have uh, finally you get to a place where you have an opportunity to uh, get a job somewhere. And the first question might be, do you have your captain's license? So if you do have your captain's license, that's like your ticket. You just step right aboard and off you go. If you don't have your captain's license, you may have to tell that person or that opportunity that no, you're working on it and I'll come back when I have it. Well, that job might not be there. That opportunity might not be there when you when you get back. So captain's license is one of those things that's kind of like a it's it's an and rather than a but. So when I say that, I mean that it's one of those things that you can be a smart kid. You can be energetic, enthusiastic, and you have your captain's license or you can be a smart kid that's, you know, looking looking for uh, an opportunity, but he doesn't have a captain's license, right? There's a big difference there. So you want to, whether you ever use your captain's license or not, you want to develop uh, as many ands as possible and as few buts <laughs> as you can uh, have. So the captain's license is definitely an and. Having it is certainly not going to be a negative in any way, shape, or form. So if you are considering a career in the outdoors, having a captain's license is definitely a step in the right direction. So that's that would be that would be a big point for me to get that. All right, question two. Who's going to win the Jake Paul Ben Askren fight? <laughs> oh, man. Um, Jake Paul Ben Askren. God, I hope it's Ben Askren. Man, I hope it's Ben Askren. Ben Askren is an amazing MMA fighter and an even more amazing wrestler. He's not pretty because he's different than anything anybody's ever seen before. Whew. But I don't know. It seems like Jake Paul's really training. Seems like he's getting a lot of coaching. I hope 
Ben Askren is training, and I hope that it goes the way that it should go, that a professional fighter, somebody that's wrestled their entire life and, and is a professional fighter, been a world champion, um, just goes in there and just destroys an amateur YouTuber. But on the other hand, if an amateur YouTuber is working really, 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 really hard, anything can happen. And Jake Paul, I think, he looks like he's a pretty big guy. And he looks like he hits hard. So I think Ben Askren doesn't want to get hit by him a lot, even if he's an amateur. And I think that uh, he could knock somebody out. He could definitely knock somebody out. And that somebody could be Ben Askren. And that would be embarrassing for everyone associated with with uh, MMA or wrestling or high-level stuff. So, Ben Askren, please, please train. Take this fight seriously and go in there and do do the business and, and win the fight. That's what I hope. That's what I hope. So I don't know. I don't know. What's your what do you, what do you guys think? What do you think, Connor? Who's going to win that? And I hope it's been Askren, but I mean Jake Paul's last fight, he creamed I forgot who he was fighting that ex NBA player. Yeah. And he made him look silly, so But it, there's never been a basketball player that's good at fighting. So you know, there's that. But I don't know. I mean, the, Ben Askren actually has skills. Like, he has a lot of skills. And Ben Askren, I don't know how many times that basketball player's been hit in the face, but Ben Askren's been hit in the face his entire life. So, and it shows. Have you seen his face? It looks like he's been hit in his face a lot. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, uh, I think I think Ben Askren is definitely way tougher opponent than whoever he's faced before. But, like I say, man, it's a boxing ring. Anything can happen. I just hope it's Ben Askren. Man, I hope it's Ben Askren. I don't know. Jake Paul just makes you want to smash him in the face. <laughs> he does. Yeah, He's I got a smashable <laughs> face. Uh, but he happens to be like 210 pounds or something. So, I don't know. Pretty big guy. Okay, what else we got? All right, next question is, I'm thinking about getting into CrossFit. Where do you suggest starting? Okay. First of all, I think that's a wonderful idea if you're interested in it and if you think it would be fun and if you're if that's something that that you kind of want to do i would say that crossfit's not really for everyone but it's a i mean i love it i i I like to do it and uh it's been really good for me um it's really good for a lot of people so if it's something that you're interested in i would highly suggest it i would go to um to a really good crossfit gym i would find the different gyms in your in your area I'd find one that, uh, well, first of all, I'd find the ones that are that are close to you. And I'd go in there and I'd talk to the trainers and I'd, I'd ask them. I'd talk to the gym owner. I'd kind of get a feel of what the, what the culture's like in there. And every one of these CrossFit gyms will have a little bit different vibe, a little bit different culture. Some are oriented more towards uh, weekend competitions, you know, the CrossFit games. Some are oriented, and that may be what you're into. Some are oriented more into... Uh, military training. Some are oriented more towards just kind of regular people getting off the couch. You're not going to find a lot of elite athletes in there. So that may be exactly what you want. Or if you're an elite athlete, you want to maybe move over to where a place where you're going to be challenged. So going to several different gyms, kind of looking at the different classes, talking to the instructors, they can say, hey, look, you know, what you're seeing right here, this is you know, our elderly class, this is our, you know, 60 plus class. If you look like you're, you know, really pretty fit, you want to come and check out the, the six o'clock in the morning class. That's where all the, that's where all the real athletes are. And that might be what you're a little more interested in. And then once you find the different gyms and you kind of determine which one is, is, is the one that you most fit with and most fits your goals. Um, I'd also look at where they are. Like, is the one that you really want to be a part of, is that 45 minutes away from you across town? Is that going to be really easy to get to? What about the one that's closer? Is it almost as good of a, of a vibe and it's much, much closer and it's going to lend itself to you going more often. Those are things to consider. And then 
you know, the other thing is that, uh, you know, CrossFit uses a lot of uh, different types of movements and skills. And um, you want to make sure that you're learning those properly. So usually there's an on-ramp course. A lot of good gyms uh, require that you do the on-ramp course. Don't, um, don't overlook that because you're going to learn some you're going to learn some things that are going to keep you from getting injured. You're going to learn some things that are going to keep you healthy and move you further down the road faster. So you may have to take two weeks to do this on-ramp course, but it may pay off uh, big dividends down the road. So if somebody requires you to do that, go in there with a good attitude, learn the skills, learn the learn what they want you to learn to, to be a good gym member, and, and then move on and go down the road. And uh, if, if, if you like it, stay with it. And... Um, you know, you can you can get great health benefits from CrossFit. So that's that's what I would suggest. All right, next question. I'm coming to the Keys this summer. What do you suggest for a family trip with kids? Um, okay, so that's a that's a question that man, I get that email often, like a whole bunch of times. And and the the answer is really pretty simple. Um, we've tied our uh, Hawks K has been our home away from home for 18 years and Hawks K is, you know, I have a relationship with them. And so this is coming from a kind of a biased place, but I've lived in the keys for a long time. I've stayed all around the keys. I've been to a lot of different places. In my opinion, Hawks K is the best place for a family. Um, you can take that for what it's worth because I'm, you know, I have a relationship with them, but I really do believe that, that it's the best for a family. Uh, there's a big property. You can you don't have to worry about the kids um, so much. You can kind of let them run free a little bit. There's charter guides right there. There are um, activities. There's pool. There's restaurants. It's it's a great place. So I would suggest definitely checking into it. Look at it if that's what you want to do. Go to go to Hawks K. Um, and then depending on how old the kids are, I would have varying. Uh, advice so first if they're young I would uh, suggest trying to go on some sort of fishing trip where you're being mindful of their attention span so if you have really young kids a half day is probably going to be plenty um, and I would do it in a boat that is comfortable um, and that nobody's going to get seasick so a bay boat would be my first choice where you can stay kind of inshore the waves aren't going to be too big uh, nobody's going to get seasick the gunnels are short enough to where a little kid can see over the gunnel they can fish over the gunnel it's going to be some type of fishing where they're able to hold the rod in their hand and hook the fish and fight the fish and land the fish all by themselves and then I would talk to the captain and I would you know, if that's if that's the situation we're in, I would say, you know, I don't care what fish we catch. Is there a way that we can keep the rod bent all day? What's the most action we can go for? It can be pinfish and and uh, snappers. It can be Jack Cravels. Don't don't care. I'd rather catch twenty Jack Cravels than one bonefish. So that's what we're that's what we're after. Because a little kid doesn't know the difference between a Jack Cravel and a bonefish. A fish is a fish. The rod's bent. So keep them entertained, keep them excited and leave before they're tapped out so that they still want to be out there. And, you know, you cut it off to where they're begging you to stay out there again. They're begging you to go out again the next day. That is a way better situation where you leave a little bit in the tank rather than just bringing them back sunburned and tired and asleep and 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 just way too much. And you might find that they might not be as excited about it. But I think for little kids, a half day is plenty. And sometimes you go out there for three of the four hours in a half day and, and call it call it good. Leave just a little bit in the tank. Now, if your kids are a little bit um, older, you can, um, you know, they'll have a little bit large, longer attention span. And maybe, maybe you do want to go after the redfish or the snook or the bonefish or the tarpon or something like that because you have a little bit longer attention span um and maybe it's something that everybody wants to do but i'm a big fan of action with kids i'm a big fan of of uh, of having the rod bent lots 
And if they get tired of it, good, move. Move and go do something else. But instead of going bone fishing first and doing that for four hours and getting one bite and then going to catch a bunch of snappers, I would rather go catch a whole bunch of snappers until they say, well, we've caught, what What else can we do? Okay, well now let's go catch a whole bunch of Jack Crevels. Okay, great. Now there's two hours left. Do you want to try bone fishing if the tide's right or permit fishing or tarpon fishing or whatever? So you've already caught a whole bunch of fish. And if you don't catch a bone fish, you've had a great day already. And that's kind of how I would kind of structure and orient my family trips when I had the opportunity to. Sometimes the tide doesn't allow for that. So I don't know. That's that's kind of my advice. I would I would lean towards the action and I'd go in a in a boat where nobody's gonna get seasick. Okay, so this kind of leads into the next question. If I wanted to book a guided trip in the Keys, what species would be the most fun to target in your opinion? Mm. Well, my opinion doesn't doesn't count um if if you're coming to the keys it's it's all about what you want it doesn't have anything to do with what i want or what i think is cool or what what social media says is cool like just like the last question um would you rather have one big kind of hard to catch fish or would you rather have a lot of action on fish that are easier to catch like jack crevels or or sharks or or barracudas or something like that like there are plenty of fish around that give the opportunity to catch way more of them than other fish like you're not going to go out and catch 50 permit but you might go out and catch 50 jack crevels and you might go out and catch 50 snappers i mean you could definitely do that um so you know, it, it, it all depends on what you want to do. So in that situation, I would talk to the guide that you're going to go with. And I would say, you know, I'm interested in having the best day possible. Like I would like to catch the biggest fish possible, no matter what that is. Or I would like to catch the most fish possible, no matter what those are. Or, you know what? I'm going to put the day in your hands. Whatever you think is going to be the best, that's what I would like to do. But it helps the guide to know that, you know, you'd rather catch more than rather than a certain species. So, you know, it, it all is proper communication between the angler and the guide in order to, to start down the road of having a good trip. So if you say to the guide, you know what, I've never been bone fishing before. It would make my day to catch a bonefish. Just catch one. That would be amazing. Okay, well, you just put the guide on. Now he's laser focused. Okay, all I got to do is catch a bonefish. This guy's going to have a great day. But if you come back to the dock later and you're like, wow, we only caught one. Well, that wasn't proper communication, right? Proper communication is, listen, I don't mind. I don't really care about Jack Crevels. I've caught those a bunch of times. I don't really care about snappers. I want to catch a bonefish. I don't come to the Keys very often. If let's do whatever we can to catch a bonefish. I don't care what method we can chum, we can use live shrimp, we can fly fish, whatever you think is going to be the most effective to catch a bonefish. If I catch a bonefish, my day's made. Okay, great. That's the marching orders. Whereas somebody else might might say something totally different. Like, man, I've never seen any of these fish. I'd like to catch as many species as possible. Like, I'd like to see as many different fish as I can. Okay, great. That's good communication. And that gives the guide something to work with. And, it, and they say, okay, cool. Well, if we go in the Everglades, we're going to catch all kinds of stuff. Or if we go out reef fishing, we're going to catch, you know, tons of different fish. So those are, those are the pieces of advice I would think it, uh, would, would help you is try to figure out something that, that kind of you want to do. Um, and, and then talk to the guide about it and just, just say, I mean, a lot of times I just say best available. Like if I get on somebody else's boat, they're like, what do you want to do? Like best available, man, whatever you think. You're getting on his boat. It's his program. He knows or she knows what's happening. And, you know, what would you do today? Okay, let's do that. Sounds good. And oftentimes that's going to be how you get a really good day. All right, next question, another Keys-related question. Which key should I stay on for the best fishing experience? Well, the keys are 150 miles long, and one end of the keys is a little different than the other end of the keys, but you are going to have great fishing opportunities anywhere in the Florida Keys that you go. And um, 
I can tell you this, that the most variety is going to happen somewhere in the middle keys because somewhere in the middle keys, Marathon to Isla Morada, you have the opportunity to run back into the Everglades and do all of that kind of fishing. You could even fish in fresh water. From Hawks K, you can run back into the Everglades. You can fish in fresh water if you want to, catch a largemouth bass, snook, redfish, tarpon, trout, everything that's in the Everglades. You can come back out and uh, and be fishing for bonefish and permit and snappers and groupers and everything like that. So having the Everglades as accessible by 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 water, you know, somewhat within an hour opens up a tremendous amount of opportunity that, you know, down in Key West, you don't have. That being said, Key West has some great opportunities that other people don't have. So for the most variety, you know, not to mention that from from the Middle Keys, I can trailer to Key West. I can trailer to Key Largo. I can go out and fish swordfish uh, off the drop right out in front i can got reef fishing out there which i have all of that you know in key west or, or anywhere else but being able to go back into the back country and fish um the everglades makes the middle keys hawks k area kind of the best destination for variety especially if you have uh, your boat on a trailer you can go up the keys you can go down the keys everglades offshore so not a lot of places that you can do it as effectively there. Um, Key West, love Key West. That's where I made my career and lived and uh, love the fishing down there. Um, so you're not going to go wrong there. Key Largo, you got Biscayne Bay. You've got uh, the Everglades. You've got the Oceanside. Not going to go wrong there either. So, you know, seasonally, you might have better bone fishing or permit fishing or tarpon fishing in one particular area than the, than another, but but you know you can pretty much throw a dart and and wherever it lands you're gonna have some pretty good fishing in the Florida Keys. So I don't I don't really know that there is a best. All right, next question. I'm looking into starting my own podcast. Where should I start? Okay, we just did a How to Tuesday on this yesterday. So if if you're just now listening to to this, go back to yesterday's podcast, which was how to start your own podcast. Now, this is a question that I get really often these days because podcasting is hot. Podcasting is a very effective way to communicate with people that are interested in whatever it is that you have to offer, whether that's I don't know. You got a restaurant, you're a real estate broker, you're a fishing guide, you're a hunting guide, you're a snorkel operator, you're whatever you are. A podcast gives you the opportunity for longer form um, content, something like this, question and answer. If you if you have a, a fishing charter business, like what are the 10 most frequent questions that you get? Can you address them in a podcast form? Can you put that on your website? It, would that be helpful to um, someone that's trying to determine whether you're a better choice than this other one, um, this other operation that they're looking at? They can hear your voice. They can hear that you're you're real, that you care, that you that you um, are interested in 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 their experience. So for those reasons, podcasting is great. Podcasting is also super cheap. You can um, you can reach all of these people with a minimal amount of gear. So. Uh, we went way more into it yesterday, so I would definitely uh, go back and listen to that. But um, I'm, ha- I'm, wa- I'm happy to help you. Waypoint is happy to help you. And there are some p- um, packages that you can buy that will uh, get you podcasting immediately and even show you how maybe if you can develop some listeners of your podcast, you will um, have a you, you might be able to make some money doing it. And um you know, most people that are podcasting are definitely not making money doing it um, or not directly. They're making money because they're getting more charters or they're making money because they're getting, you know, more more home sales or they're bringing more people to their restaurant like we talked about. And that is indirectly because of the podcast. But a lot of people, very few people are making money off their podcast. There, there are ways that you can do that and we can help you do that. So 
I would I would uh, send me an email podcast at saltwater podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. Let me know that you're interested in starting your own podcast and I'll point you in the right direction and help you out. All right, next question. I'm coming down to Hawks K with my two teenage boys looking at the difference between inshore and offshore fishing options. What differences can I expect? Okay, that's a great question. And man, this time of the year, I'm fielding, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 of these um, a day because people, a lot of people are booking their trips um, for the summer, for spring break. It's a very busy time. Spring is a great time. Summer is a great time to fish in the Keys. So inshore, you can expect that the species that are available to you are tarpon, permit, bonefish, redfish, snook, sharks, barracudas, jack crevels, snappers, I don't know, goliath groupers, maybe a cobia here and there, um, those, those type of fish. You're going to stay in shallower water. You, No one is going to get seasick. You're going to, usually you're going to be casting by yourself, hooking the fish by yourself, and it's a real one-on-one experience. Offshore fishing can mean lots of different things. You could go offshore in a big trolling boat, which may be the right boat for you, and it may not be. If you want to handle the rod, cast, hook the fish, land the fish all by yourself, eh, I'm, I'm sure that happens sometimes on those bigger boats, but typically you're trolling around, a fish bites, the mate runs over, and um, you know, turns the crank a bunch of times, make sure the fish is hooked, and then lets you reel it in. Okay, if you've never been out on the ocean before, that might be kind of fun. But if you've done a lot of fishing, then maybe you're like, hmm, I don't know, I don't know that that's really what I want to do. Maybe your boys kind of were like, I, th- I thought, I thought we were going to be doing the ones fishing. We were going to be the ones fishing. Um, now that may change when a fifty-pound dolphin comes over the rail, and everybody's super excited. Um, so that's just one type of fishing, not right, not wrong, not better, not worse. Just That's just kind of the way it goes out there. Then you have um, center console offshore, and it's usually a guide um, by himself. Sometimes he has a mate, but not always. And that's going to be a little bit more of you holding the rod, you setting the hook, making the cast, fighting the fish all the way in, all by yourself. You're, it's a little more hands-on. A lot more hands-on. Um, you could expect that you're going to go and probably start the day yellowtailing, which you're going to fish for yellowtail snapper. You're going to be on the anchor uh, on the reef, and you're going to start chumming for yellowtail snapper. Of course, you can catch all kinds of things when you're doing that. You can catch mutton snappers on the bottom, all different kinds of snappers. You have mackerels come through. You could catch, you could catch all different kinds of stuff: barracudas, everything. You might see a shark. So yellowtail snapper is. Uh, you know, we'll go snapper fishing first, and you might catch all different kinds of things. But you might also catch some yellowtail snappers. And then once everybody's kind of happy, maybe you get a l- limited yellowtail. Maybe you go out and you look for dolphin, uh, mahi mahi, or um, sailfish, or something else, tuna, something like that. So that's a very common day uh, for for offshore guides. It's good because there's lots of action. There's um, you know the fish are beautiful. The water's beautiful, um, and and it's a fun thing to do. So that's kind of a a thing. Then there's kind of a nearshore kind of day where maybe you don't go all the way out to the reef. You fish these patch reefs, and you can catch a lot of snappers and all kinds of stuff uh, there and and just lots of action. So then you could go way out and, and go sword fishing, which is an entirely different experience. So the offshore fishing, if that's kind of something that's interesting to you i would definitely suggest talking to the guide and you know the difference between um you know sitting and and uh yellowtail snapper fishing all day and running and gunning for mahi mahi it's a big difference it's a different experience through the day so you just mentioned to the guide that you know this is something that you're interested in and and uh what you know what what is what does he think and uh, he'll, he'll tell you, you know, eh, there hadn't been a lot of dolphin around, but we can go look for them. Um, 
what's really then well what have you been catching oh we've been catching a ton of tuna oh well that sounds good let's do that okay um so it can go down like that now the offshore boats we talked about you you got the big offshore trolling boats you got the center console boats and the center console boats can be you know anything from you know 42 feet to to 26 pretty much and uh and and the smaller boat is actually um more versatile than the larger boats because with a smaller boat like a 26 26 yellowfin um you can actually go into the back country you can fish the bridges more effectively it's more maneuverable you can uh get back into shallow water you can um do things like maybe you could go shark fishing in in the back and not that you couldn't do that out of a 36 but a, a 26 is just a little more maneuverable sometimes you can use a trolling motor with it um gives you a few more options now of course if it's rough you're going to have a few more deep water options with a larger boat because it's able to handle the, the the bigger water better than a smaller boat so it's a little give and take there's no perfect boat um but I think there is a most versatile boat. And in my opinion, like a, a 26 to a 32 is pretty versatile. You can definitely fish at the bridges with, with a boat like that very effectively. And uh, you can go in and out of the bridge pilings and, and uh, navigate really well in shallow water. Where some other bigger boats might not even want to. Captain might not even ever go to that side of the bridge. So I don't know. They're just all about offshore and that's fun. Um, we have, uh, you know, there's at, at Hawks K, you have a 26 foot boat uh, under the end of the blue name. Uh, Brandon Simmons runs that. He's fantastic. We had Brandon on the show a couple of times and uh, he's, he's doing great work down there. He's great with families. He's great with kids. He's great with expert anglers. He's great with beginners. So highly recommended. You can check him out. It's easy to do that. You go to the hawkskay.com. You look up fishing charters and you'll see into the blue and you just hit read more and you can even go and check out his schedule where, you know, what, what he's got available. You can book it right there on the, on the website if you want uh, full day, half day, three quarter day. Um, and then on the inshore side, we have a saltwater experience boat, which is a 24 yellowfin. It's just like the one that you see uh, us, us fishing on the show, 24 um, yellowfin that goes back that's Anthony Vargas. He runs that boat for us, and he goes back into the Everglades. He uh, fishes the bridge. He bone fishes. He permit fishes. He tarpon fishes. He goes to the, uh, uh, you know, way back in the shallow water in the Everglades, fishing for redfish and snook and trout. And uh, Anthony just kind of does it all. He's another guy that's great with beginners. He's great with families. He's great with experts. Um, so you got two good opportunities there. And then you can take that advice that I just gave you and kind of apply it up and down the keys to, and it's going to be pretty, pretty similar, um, you know, as far as the boats go and the species and all of that. But uh, a lot of good fishing opportunities in the keys. So if you're bringing your boys down there inshore and offshore, I hope that helps with what you might expect. All right. Last question is. I'm going fly fishing for tarpon. What would be one tip to know before I go down there? Hmm. Okay. Practice for sure. Definitely want to practice. I want to be good at, at casting, um, you know, from zero, from the ready position to 50 feet. Smoothly, quickly, accurately with, with as few false casts as possible. So that's kind of the minimum requirement. If you can get to 70 feet like that, great. If you can get to 80, great, even better. Um, but here's one thing that, that, I, <laughs> that I remember people would do all the time. Drove me crazy. They would buy a new fly rod. They would practice with it. And they would, then they would get a new line, and they would show up on my boat, and there would be nothing attached to the end of the fly line. And so now we're, we, we leave the dock at 5 o'clock in the morning to go out and get the first tarpon bite. And it's, you know, basically dark. And they've got this brand new rod that they've never caught a fish on and they really want to. And I pull it out and it doesn't even have a leader on it. It doesn't even have a butt section on it. It's got nothing on the end of the fly line. Man, don't show up like that. 
Show up with something. Show up with a piece of of uh, of a fifty or sixty pound butt section. Taper it down to you know thirty with a loop, so that you could tie you could loop to loop a tarpon leader right on it, or the guide can cut that loop off and tie a blood knot right there and have you at least with something that you can catch something on. But to show up with nothing on the end of your of your fly line and expect to catch a fish on your your rod it may make you miss a lot of opportunities because now you're 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 you have a knot party going on where or just grab the guide's rod and fish with that one until you have time to get something on the end of the line but for the most part show up with something talk to your fly shop if you don't know how to do it talk to the fly shop where you bought the thing um and and ask them if they can get you some sort of butt section on the end of the end of the the fly line it's going to make it much easier for your guide to get a a fly on there and you you should be fishing you know right away and uh that make things it'll make it it, it'll instead of having a rocky start to your day it'll make it uh at least a little bit a little bit better so that's what i would suggest practice and then show up show up with something on the end of your of your fly line that's it all right well, I appreciate the questions. Thanks for that. And this is this is different. You know, if you got questions, we can do more of these How To Tuesdays. I kind of like to do them. It's kind of fun to to uh, know what people are are asking. Um, but if you got questions, you can either email podcast at saltwaterexperience dot com or you can text three zero five nine three zero seven three four six, and you can ask me the questions there. Um, but if we get enough questions, we'll we'll do another How To Tuesday. I mean, not a How To Tuesday, a, a question and answer long form but that's it for today uh, send me those questions and uh, hopefully these helped the people who asked the questions and um, I'll look forward to hearing from you alright see you.